Uh, good evening. My name is Kenny Young, and I'm this year's chair of the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. The VIP Distinguished Speaker Series is one of many programs put on by the Undergraduate Business Council for the Red McCombs School of Business. Today, we are joined by Dean Laura Starks, Dean of McCombs, and Mr. Rich Templeton, Chairman, President, and CEO of Texas Instruments. We'll begin tonight with an interview between Dean Starks and Mr. Templeton. Then, we will open the floor up to Q&A from the audience. As a reminder, today's event will end promptly at 6.30 p.m. We would greatly appreciate if you could refrain from leaving early and from using electronic devices. Rich Templeton is Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Texas Instruments Incorporated. He joined the company in 1980, immediately after earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Union College in New York. He began his TI career in sales and eventually became President of the company's semiconductor business. In 2004, Mr. Templeton became President and Chief Executive Officer of TI. Mr. Templeton has served on the company's board of directors since July 2003 and became chairman of the board in 2008. As CEO, Mr. Templeton has not been afraid to reshape the company, focusing resources on both uh, growth opportunities in TI's core business of analog and embedded processing. Temple Templeton has led TI to become the global leader in analog integrated circuits while still maintaining the company's strengths in embedded systems and digital signal processing. He has topped the list of institutional investors' best semiconductor CEOs in America for several years, most recently in 2015. Templeton, like the company he runs, is industry and civic-minded. He focuses much of his external energies on public issues and initiatives that advance the high-tech high industry in STEM education. Under his leadership, TI and TI Foundation have invested $150 million over the last five years to strengthen global education programs, including K-12 STEM teaching and student achievement. In 2012, the Semiconductor Industry Association awarded him its highest honor, citing his service as a vigorous advocate for STEM education and longtime champion of research and innovation. In addition to numerous, numerous board memberships, Templeton has personally led the company's United Way campaign for many years, resulting in tens of millions of dollars of donations to a variety of charitable organizations. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dean Starks and Mr. Templeton. Thank you, very, this is working. Thank you very much, Kenny, and welcome, Rich. We're really happy to have you here. It's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight. So we look, I'm going to start out with some background questions so we can know what he was like before he started TI. So actually, no. I'd be surprised if you get that data, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, actually, I just said that wrong because the first question is, tell us about your very first job, which, oh, may not have been at TI, I guess. No, it wasn't. No, we, uh, my brother and I, we ran a business, uh, and uh, we would do just about anything from building things to mowing lawns to selling firewood, any way to make money, and that was the first one. Um, and what set you apart from your peers to get you where you are now? You know, I'm, uh, I'm careful with that answer because I wasn't the one viewing what did I look like or what did I do. <laughs> But you know, I think most people, if you uh, work inside a company and try to look down and figure out who do you want to promote, what are you looking for, uh, it's really, does somebody know where they want to go or where do they want to take their group, and can they get them there? And those are probably the two things that get looked for, is my guess, uh, uh, back when they were looking at me and probably what we look for today. So. When you were in college, did you expect you'd be a CEO of a very large company? No. I didn't expect See? to be CEO <laughs> well into my years of TI. <laughs> in fact, I didn't think I'd be CEO until I was told you're going to be CEO. So. <laughs> so who do you admire most? You know, it's, it's um, maybe a funny way going the other way on that is I'll get questions many times on, well, you know, gee, I'm, I'm struggling, I don't have a great boss, and I can't learn from him. And I'm like, no, you know, you can learn from any boss you have. You can learn from the worst ones, <laughs> and you can learn from the great ones. And so, you know, I've been lucky, and I think I've had, you know, really a lot of good ones during my time at TI, but you learn different things from all of them. Some you learn the power of curiosity, some the importance of details, uh, some how to organize, some how to drive. Um, and I've had some that weren't great at things, and that's a great thing you can learn as well. You say, hey, if I get to a position, I'm sure not going to do that, and, you know, it can be pretty powerful on that front. So uh, I've been fortunate. It is, it is helpful to have people that you can learn from and, and you can really study. 
So is there something that you haven't mastered yet that you would still like to do? Uh, you know, mastered uh, uh, implies a completion. And I just uh, tend to focus much more on uh, probably personal life and business is, are you gonna leave things stronger when you're done? And that could be the company you work for, your family, the school you're affiliated with, whatever that, that institution is. So to me, it's every day can you get better. And so mastering is, I don't, that's an asymptotic approach somewhere I don't, I don't worry about. Okay, well this one, now the next question, we're gonna go the opposite uh -oh. direction. What's the uh, biggest mistake you've made in your career? Notice it doesn't say life, it says career. It says career. I assume that meant life, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, you can tell us that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I'm, I'm really quite pleased that I don't mean that because I'm CEO. I mean it because uh, I have enjoyed life, enjoyed raising a family, enjoyed the people I've gotten to work at, uh, work with at TI, uh, what I get to do in the community. And so I go, I go through that set of things. I'm like, boy, I'm as lucky as I can be uh, when it comes to that. So when you first started working, do you remember any things that you thought, oh man, I, I should have done something differently? Oh, I think you can always study uh, many of the things that you do. And you can figure out one's a boy, face to this again, know this, learn that, take a different path. Uh, but I don't, um, I catalog those more as improvement as of studying them on you know, was this some regretful mistake? Because in our business, um, you will be rewarded for moving fast and correcting as you go. And if you find people trying to avoid ever making a mistake, you'll probably find people avoiding taking action. And that's usually, especially in a technology business, uh, that's more problematic. So what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? Uh, we, heard, we heard a whole lot of accomplishments from Kenny, so that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Kenny had a good list, you know. Um, yeah, probably raising family, keeping life balanced and uh, doing well on that side and at the same time uh, enjoying a career. So you have spent your entire career at TI. Uh, what is it about TI that's kept you there for all these years? Yeah, you know, I get a chance to meet a number of people that you know, I've been working 30 or 35 years. And I feel so fortunate because you'll meet people that are bored in their work or it isn't that exciting or putting in the time. And, you know, I'm as excited about what I do and what TI does, the customer, you know, I get to work with the smartest people in the world, both the TI and our customers. Uh, they're solving just amazing problems every day. Uh, so to me, it's just, it's always been the excitement. And the thing that I think really kept me attracted, and I think it's how we keep our best people attracted to the company, is every time you get one thing solved, you usually get thrown something else that's broken. And you get back to work on fixing that. <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, for people that like the competition, like uh, that type of work, it's, uh, uh, it's really very satisfying. So that's what's, you know, I never made a decision uh, to be at a company for 35 years. It was, you know, one, two years at a time. So, TI is on the Forbes uh, 100 best places to work. Um, how do you keep it there? Well, the good news was we had great <coughs> leaders that set the company up. And, and if you don't have the right values and the right foundation, I don't care if you're selling calculators like we do or semiconductor chips or whatever you're in, if you don't have the right values in terms of how you expect to treat people, how you want to be treated, uh, how you should operate ethically out in the community and around the world, uh, the importance of innovation, um, you'll get lost. And you've you know the list of companies that have gotten lost uh, because they lack that foundation underneath. So I think that that has been probably the greatest, you know, we're a 90-year-old company and we've done a lot of different things, uh, but that is, a, uh, that is a standard that remains unchanged on that front. So a related question would be um, how you view corporate social responsibility. 
it, it, one and the same. Um, you know, the, the way that I've tended to, to develop it, we talk about it uh, quite openly and, and externally, is great companies build great communities and great communities build great companies. So they're, they're actually one and the same. It's not I invest because I have to or I want to. Uh, you know, look at some cities, uh, you know, take some challenging cities like a Rochester, New York, where uh, someone like Kodak and Xerox were so great. And without those great companies, it's a struggling city. Mm -hmm. And so you just look at that and you're like, boy, this is, this is an important responsibility of you need to invest in the communities you're in, and they in turn help build you stronger. We also find a really interesting thing that when you've prioritized community giving and involvement, uh, your employees tend to feel that there's a greater sense of purpose than just what do I do at work? And that tends to be a pretty powerful, um, in some ways you could think of it, it just balances out life a little better, I think for everybody. And so we've been, we've, luck, we've been lucky, we've had a strong tradition and we've been able to maintain that and keep it going. Um, in your time as CEO, what has Texas Instruments done differently than its competitors to set itself apart? Oh, probably the most important thing is to, in our business, not be afraid to change. Um, you know, if you go back seven or eight years ago at TI, uh, we were powering half the cell phones in the world. And we looked out at that business and what it was going to do for the next 10 years, and we said, that's not that movie's not gonna end well. So don't, don't sit around and wait for the yeah, movie to end yeah. and clean up the problem. Go inject change and get your people moving out in a new direction. And, uh, and we're fortunate that even though we're a large company, uh, we're used to change and you know, when properly uh, organized and shaped, uh, people can say, let's go. It's, uh, it's a new future we're gonna go create. So, uh, I give our team a lot of credit that they've been willing to go on those journeys and make those changes. And, and fortunately, we've made some of those calls correctly and we've been rewarded for it. So what is Texas Instruments going to need to do to continue to thrive in today's market? You know, it's probably, uh, it's probably twofold. That is stay connected and innovative, which means you gotta be out with your customers if you wanna know what's happening inside a big company. Spend the time outside because it'll lead you uh, to the to the issues that you have, and then the second aspect is make sure you're bringing great people in, witness those that are in the audience, uh, because you know five years from now and ten years from now you're going to need tomorrow's leaders and the next generation of leaders, and you know that rejuvenation of an organization is uh, is really very powerful. It's what makes visits like this uh, so enjoyable. So. Um how have you kept up with the rapid nature of science and technology besides bringing in the... Be curious yourself. I, I, curiosity to me is one of the simplest words, but, uh, and people use fancy ones, lifelong learning or whatever you want, and you know, just be curious. What makes stuff tick? And if you're curious about how things work and what new problems are going on, uh, you'll study them and you'll stay very, very current with, uh, with state of the art. And so it's, uh, it really is, uh, all of us, uh, everyone in the audience possess that ability uh, to stay refreshed and, and they'll be able to do that. So, so this is kind of a related question, which is how have you seen your company evolve since when you first started there? Uh, you know, hopefully we've gotten uh, more focused uh, I think in many ways, when you look over 35 years, uh, just a very simple belief, uh, you will work as hard in a bad business as you will in a good business, so why not do the hard work to make the place better and be in good businesses? And so we've tried to be more disciplined about uh, aiming forward and picking the best markets and making sure we're working on the most important things. And I think that's, in some ways, probably the, the greatest change that we've made over 30 years. So is there a special skill set you need to be a CEO, particularly a CEO at TI? Uh, I don't know if there's a special one uh, to be a CEO. I think there's probably some common ingredients to be a leader, and then they'll just be more demanding or demanding in a different way. Um, 
you've got to know where you want to go. You've got to have a, a sense or an opinion about what the right thing is. Uh, you've got to be able to work with teams or you won't get anything done. I think you've got to operate with great urgency because this world is moving and you've got to move as fast or faster than it. Um, you've got to have confidence uh, because this world will try to wear that <laughs> down. And in some ways, uh, you know, confidence versus arrogance is that very careful balance or confidence versus uh, not listening, I think, is really the, the careful balance you have to have because there's days when you better set the direction and stay with it. But you also better be listening, okay, in case you need to make corrections. Uh, but that's a very subtle distinction. So I read that you meet with employees on a regular basis, small groups of employees, to get feedback. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have, uh, we'll do open forums and, it, and cafeterias and be groups of this size, but we'll also meet, oh, I don't know, it's got to be 20 or 30 of them a year, and it may be more, um, 10, 12, 15 people as I travel around. And, you know, the biggest thing I ask them at the beginning of those sessions, they're an hour and a half, so it's, it's enough time to where you can get a little insight into what people are thinking and what they're doing. And it's a good chance for them to ask questions, but the big point I make to them at the beginning is, I'm here to learn, and I'm only gonna learn if I find out what's not right. And I also tell them I probably won't fix it, so don't you know, keep your expectations correct. Uh, but it is a great chance to try to just get a sense of where people are, what's working, what's not, and staying in touch that way. So this week in particular, there, we've had a lot of ethics issues in, in corporations, and, and what, how do you construct the company so that you can, you can um, count on having a more ethical set of employees? Yeah, it's, uh, it is an interesting week with what's going on with emissions testing and companies that are getting pulled into that cyclone. Mm -hmm. and, but you know, we're, we're really fortunate. We had an ethics office and an ethics hotline and an ethics manual, and not that those things in and of themselves are important, but they embody a belief that this is how we intend to operate. And we had them back really starting in the early 70s. And it, as you know, Laura, probably didn't become popular until you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago in terms of getting that set up. So it has always been, as I commented before, a foundation of how we've operated. And what we tend to find is the best way to keep an organization policed is enroll everybody. Because if you have everybody, all 30 odd thousand employees enrolled and knowing what right is and what wrong is, and if something looks wrong, tell somebody. Okay, it's just that simple. Um, it's a very powerful approach when you really get every employee because in the end, it is our company. And if we let something you know, go wrong, it will hurt us. And, uh, and we're fortunate that we, we've got that culture, we've got the structure, we keep it reinforced. Uh, and and it, takes, it takes acting when a problem comes up, you better handle it correctly or people will stop telling you about problems. But uh, fortunately, we're on the right side of that. Uh, and that's the best way. To, uh, to make sure it's really lasting. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Best piece of advice? Well, one of them is non-advice and one is advice. The non-advice is, you know, I grew up in upstate New York. My dad was an IBMer. I worked summers at IBM. And he gave me no advice as I graduated from college and went off to work, okay? <laughs> Which was probably the best thing in the world to do. <laughs> because it's your career, so you make the choices because you'll deal with it then. And, and in many ways, uh, I think that's really, was really a great, uh, great start. Just you pick what you want to do and you then have to live with it and work <laughs> your way through. The other one was, um, uh, I worked for, eventually became CEO. It was the early 90s, I, you know, my kids were young, I was traveling all the time. And I got just, and it was the briefest of, I assume you want to raise your family right and once. Uh, yeah, it would be a good idea. Because we'll make sure you stay balanced. Uh, okay, probably pretty good advice. <laughs> that you and it really is a case mm -hmm. that you can do both. Mm -hmm. And you know, when my kids were growing up. I coached all their teams, and 
and did everything. And you can make that happen. You've just got to want to do that. You are the person that's in control of that balance. And, uh, and I've been fortunate to do that. It was good advice. Um, and so the last question, we have time for one more question. Kenny's giving you the keep going <laughs> sign. What makes a person stand out to you as you evaluate those you manage? Uh, you know, one of the greatest things, and, and it's why interviews are so weak, because an interview is a 45-minute snapshot or a, a very condensed piece. And uh, I like seeing people in a work environment. I like seeing people over time, uh, because this is a business of getting things done, not who looks good or who had some good ideas at one point. And it's really why the approach we use is very much to get involved and watch people down talking about their business or talking about their sales operation or their manufacturing operation. And that's when you can see what might be superficial and where there's real depth. And you can watch the person struggle through the commitments they made and who got beaten back and who overcame it. And, and that's where you can really determine it. But you'll see a lot of the things I described before. Who's got urgency to act? Um, who has followership, and it's you know something I tell a lot of people. They're like, I'm ready to be a leader. I'm like, well, do people follow you? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, when you turn around, are they following you? <laughs> and and you can't tell people to follow you, uh, as you know, it's a it's achieved many different ways. Sometimes by knowledge, sometimes by just you know passion and enthusiasm. Uh, there's lots of different techniques to do that, and. Uh, and we have lots of different leaders that way, but those are the things you look for and you try to spot. Um, so what surprises you about your job? Um, most surprising thing is probably that so many people uh, wanna know questions like will potentially get asked in a few minutes. Like, how was your career planned, or where those things? I'm like, ah, I didn't have a plan, you know. I just, I just stayed focused on work. Uh, but people really are uh, fascinated by by that. I think it's an honor because they they want to achieve a level of success and those ambitions, which I think are wonderful. Uh, but that that's probably the one I found most surprising in, in all things. I shouldn't be, but I was. So, if you could change one thing about your job, what would you change? Solve jet lag. <laughs> and you and I could open up a business, Laura, if we could, if we could come up for a cure with jet lag. I love traveling around because you get to meet people. It, it is the best part of my job, meeting brilliant TIers, brilliant customers, and the only issue is they're in all corners of the globe. <laughs> so we've got to get around the world to do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much and well, now you. we're going to be the university of what's next i don't know if you've seen this we are we are now the university of what's next and so what's next is you have the opportunity to ask your own questions this is uh, the audience participation mr. part. we usually have to remind people hey mr templeton i'm david nielsen thanks for coming out today uh my question was after a particularly like busy or stressful day, what do you do to rewind, to unwind and relax? You know, I don't get stressed. And, <laughs> and I had somebody once accuse me of being a carrier, not uh, a sufferer of stress, which may be true. I just, um, you know, I exercise every day. Uh, for me, it just helps keep me refreshed, uh, keep balanced, and, uh, and, you know, I just don't let that stuff wear me down. And the only thing that will wear you down <laughs> is jet lag in terms of just time and being tired when you come back from those trips. So. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Samantha Shea. I'm a senior marketing major. And um, I'm actually going to be moving to the second round of TI's interview process. So I look forward to seeing you in another month. Um, Thank you, but <laughs> Sam? Okay. <laughs> um, but my question is a little bit more nuanced to you as a leader, specifically of a tech company, um, because I'm per personally, right now, I'm interning for a tech company, and um, I'm in charge of looking at their employee sentiment and um, kind of monitoring it throughout the company. And one of the things that they're really focused on right now as well is um, their return on investment and increasing their return on investment. But a lot of the employee sentiment around that is that they're then kind of 
sacrificing the innovation of their um, employees and what they're able to pursue um, in favor of increasing that return on employment, so or a return on investment. So I guess, um, how do you kind of continue to nurture that innovative um, culture within within TI with, without kind of losing that that return on capital that you that you invest? Yeah, if I interpret what you're saying correctly, and I may not be, um, and I probably if, well, I usually offend people with some of my comments. Uh, I'm not a big believer in measuring employee sentiment because mm -hmm. uh, it's a bunch of junk and a bunch of surveys and mm -hmm. it just tires people out. And if you want return on investment, you want people that are highly passionate about what they do. And if you as a company, you as a leader at whatever level, um, can engage the variable energy that all of us have, uh, the performance will be off the charts. So put the attention, put, the, put the, the places where you're trying to emphasize is what are you creating new, what are the new products, what are the new services, what are the new capabilities, and help pull the organization forward. And it's, it really unlocks people uh, when, you, when you go about it that way. And in the end, that's what generates great returns. If you're bringing innovative products out to customers, helping them solve their problems in a, in a way unique or different than other suppliers. Your revenue will grow, your profit margins will be higher, your stock price will go up, and everybody will be busy, but they'll actually also be pretty happy. They'll probably be tired, but they'll be happy. And that's, you know, that's what we find, and you can see it. Uh, the successful organizations inside of TI that do that well, uh, they're really, you know, success is unlimited. Or, uh, limited only by their potential on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Templeton, my name is Chris Yates. Call me Rich. Mr. Templeton's my dad. <laughs> Rich, uh, my name is Chris Yates, and my question for you is, how do you work to maintain and promote loyalty within your company? You know, I think there's, um, there's a couple pieces. You've got, to, um, you've got to have an environment that people want to be. And I go back to values, ethics, um, standards about how you, you behave and you expect to be treated and, and some of those things. And you've got to have that. <clears throat> From there, I think you've got to have an environment where um, you don't tell people I want to retain you. You have to challenge them. Uh, and I go back to the, to the question, why have I spent 35 years at TI? because I wake up every morning with something new I want to do. So when you're busy waking up every day with something new you want to do, you're probably not looking to other companies to go, to go join them. So you'll be far better uh, served by that. There's obviously things that we will do from a financial structure and, and it's just smart things in terms of industry practices, uh, and you've got to do those. But that alone isn't enough. You, you've got to get the hearts uh, really engage to keep people and to keep people challenged on that front. If you do it, you'll, you'll see your turnover, or you'll see your uh, attrition levels uh, really manage themselves well. Sure. Thank you. Hey Rich, my question is, um, what do you think your greatest impact has been on your business and then also on your, com on your community during your time as CEO? Uh, I don't know about, uh, I don't know how to judge the biggest impact. Uh, what I look at more is are we stronger today than we were five years ago, stronger than we were 10 years ago, and actually where more of my time and passion goes, very similar to that prior question, is okay, what's going to make us stronger in 2019 or 2020? Because we better be doing that stuff today to have the place stronger and performing. And it's back you know, to the question that I was asked you know, when we decided to redo our wireless business and make big changes, it was 40% of our revenue. And if anybody ever gets in that position, when you decide you're going to exit 40% of your revenue, it's a scary day. Uh, but you say, heck, we're going to be better, so let's get after it. So um, it, to me, that just constant pursuit to, to help build this place stronger. And I think those are the same sentiments in terms of what you do in the community. Uh, I'm fortunate, my wife, uh, is really great out in public. She enjoys people. She's great in that environment. 
Uh, you know, she's been involved in just about every educational institution we've been associated with, the Catholic Church, a lot of different things. And, you know, as a result, I get to work and she does that. And it's a great team on that front. So, Thank you. Hi, my name is Shane O'Dwyer, and uh, I'm also currently interviewing with your company. And um, my question for you is, how do you recognize... This is a good time to point that out, so that's, that's why. <laughs> how do you recognize and promote excellence in the workplace? You know, I think it's... Um, you have to operate consistent with a set of beliefs. And I, somewhat just coming off the heels of that, if you're committed to building the place stronger, are you committed to making the investments that you have to. So, you know, we're busy right now, in many ways, investing significantly in how we support our customers over the web uh, for obvious reasons. And that's about better technical content, better tools, better ability to search for our parts, uh, better technical solutions so when a customer comes on, they can get their job done faster, all those types of things. And, and our, our people are, just like you guys, are, they're pretty smart. And if you say we want to get stronger and we want to do something, you know, but we're not willing to change or spend money or invest in that, they'll, they'll figure that out pretty quick that one of those is just a set of words. So you've just got to be consistent with, with your plans and your objectives and your actions, including are you really honest with your score? And you know, that's probably one of the biggest ones that in some ways we're probably pretty tough on. Um, You've got, you know, if, if you're a 4 and 10 team, you better admit you're 4 and 10. And then you go back and do something different because you're tired of having a losing record. And if you find teams that are 4 and 10 and they come in and tell you, ah, had a couple of bad calls, a bad break, was it off year? That's probably a team that's going to have a losing record next year. So you, you do have to be, at the same time, pretty honest with what your score looks like or what your grade is. And it's something that we pay, you know, very close attention to on that front. And competitive people love that. It, it, you know, if you know competitive people, they, they live for what's the score. And, you know, gosh, it's not as high as I want it. And back to work you go to be able to drive that. Thank you. Hi, Rich. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Um, my name is Shannon, and I was just wondering, you talked a lot about being a father. So what was one thing that you learned, have learned being a father that's really helped you in being a CEO of TI? Well, it's, it's probably those lessons you get from your wife, okay, where <laughs> you come home, especially with a daughter, and, okay, she has a problem she wants to talk about, and you start giving advice, and you get dragged away from the kitchen table, like, your job is to shut up and listen. <laughs> what do you mean? I thought you wanted to fix the problem. No, <laughs> your job right now is to listen. And the other thing in general, and to me, you know, parenting is highly humbling, okay? And it's the most powerful thing to learn as a leader. Now, you don't control everything. You may want to believe you do, but you know, you're you know, watching your kids and all the diversity that comes along with that, the ups and the downs is really a good thing. And uh, it's frustrating some days, but in general, I think it makes you a much better, better person, more balanced person, and, uh, and able to understand that. Thank you. I never did figure out the thing about not giving advice on the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was given the story. Hi, Mr. Templeton. My name is Derek Schnur, and I'm a dual major in supply chain management and electrical engineering. And I've actually just finished my second internship at TI in the mixed signal automotive business unit. Excellent. <laughs> we just covered their scorecard yesterday. So. <laughs> Good things, right? <laughs> so you talked a little bit about injecting change when the company moved away from the consumer goods, um, the cell phone market. Given the current state of the volatility in the semiconductor industry, what steps is TI taking to um, position, position itself to be successful once the market turns around? I know that you mentioned this Web First initiative, but are there other initiatives that you're taking? Yeah, we've actually got, uh, as you know, maybe from sampling or seeing it even this past summer, uh, we sat down in a very formal way. Uh, we had made those choices back in 2007 and 8 on not being as big in the wireless business. And then we sat down again in late 2012 because wireless was just about done. We said, okay, what's a stronger TI going to look like? 
five years from now, and you probably heard the stronger TI updates when you were there. And we said very specifically, products, customers, those, you know, what are the things that we want to have better five years from now? And then maybe the most important part of that was we then backed up and said, okay, if we've written something down as a future state, what are we going to do different so that that is a plan, not a wish? Because it's, I don't, I don't want a, a wish paper, we want a, you know, a real plan. And we ended up with 18 different initiatives. And when we first came up with that list, you're like, that's, you know, mind-boggling to get your head around, it's too much. And, you know, it ranged from order fulfillment, shipping on time, new product development on time, uh, demand creation, really going across many, many different of our business processes, not just organizational. And, and I've been just thrilled that the response of the team is, I think we could stop reviewing that stuff and people would keep on getting better at it right now because people are engaged, they love it, they see the results that it's producing. So uh, I think we're on a really good trajectory to, to really make that plan happen. And so I'm pretty pleased uh, with where it is. We've got a lot to do still, though. All right, thank you. Hi, Rich. I'm Prasant Kaladindi, and I'm a freshman majoring in electrical engineering. Uh, what advice would you give to first-year students like me to get a foot in the door? It was kind of demotivating at the expo having a lot of companies telling me they won't hire freshmen for internships? Get to your second year. <laughs> <laughs> then get to your third. <laughs> and, and find Sam Dwinnell and try to convince her that you want to get in. I think you just got to be persistent. Okay. And, you know, companies are going to be, and, and we try to be logical as well, that if you've got so many slots to bring great college students in, you probably would like to bias that to a sophomore, junior year just because you'd like to have the chance or the potential, if there's a good match, to be able to have them become employees. And so keep pushing and uh, don't slow down. Okay, thank you. Hi, Rich. Thanks so much for speaking with us today. Um, so you talked a little bit about your background in, as an electrical engineering major. So my question was, um, how do you think that your STEM education has influenced your leadership style? You know, I am, uh, uh, I guarantee I'm biased as a person that likes math and science and as an electrical engineer. I think one of the great things you learn uh, in engineering, in general, electrical engineering specifically, you learn how to solve problems. And structure and discipline to be able to do that. I think it, in our business, it really does help. I think it helps in a lot of places in terms of uh, that discipline or that structure. It helps you, you know, look at a problem pretty analytically. Now you have to blend in the human sides of it, not get, you know, get too lost on that front. But uh, I think it serves me well today. I think it also serves well to the question that Laura asked on curiosity. Uh, and, and I just see it, uh, anybody in this room, whether you're an engineer or not an engineer, you can go learn how things work. But if you have the background from an electrical engineering point of view, will you have just a little more confidence to keep going in an area of unknown? But uh, it just, it, you know, to me, the, the curiosity in life to go, to go understand new problems is the most powerful thing. Whether you're an engineer or not, don't, don't let it slow you down. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mesa. I'm a freshman at McCombs, um, undecided major. But I was wondering, how do you merge the connection between business and engineering? Because I'm sure that they have different perspectives, where engineers are more about design and maybe upgrading um, the different things that TI does. And business is more about how can we get, how can we strategically look at this business in a business manner? So how do you merge those together and how do you deal with potential conflicts that might rise? Yeah, I, you know, and I don't know if it's right, uh, but I see them as one and the same. And it's, uh, you'll meet people, well, I want to define strategy. Okay, okay go away. <laughs> and I say that because if you don't know what can be done or capabilities or what's the problem that you're trying to solve or, or go solve, it's hard to go put together a strategy if you don't understand implementation. So I don't, I don't see them as separate in terms of how you think, uh, and it's, it's not a conflict. Uh, you know, engineering is the practice of solving problems. It's a practice of innovation. 
business is a practice of solving problems and innovation at the same time. And to me, the easier way to think about it is where are the customers and what problem are you solving? And if you ever get confused, get, get regrounded in you know, who pays the bills, because there is only one person that, that pays money to the company when it's all said and done. And, and that blended thought is, is how you take care of that. All right, thank you. Hi, Rich. Hello. I know you're very busy, but do you have any big passions outside of work? Well, sure. The technology industry is a passionate <laughs> thing. It, it, no, I, you know, I have, you know, there is not a sporting event that I don't consider major and significant, okay? And yeah, I love sports, uh, lots of different things on that front. So, and it's, it's one of these where if there was more hours in the day, you could do more. Uh, that's the limit in terms of what your enjoyment is. So, you know, for me, I read all the time, uh, think about things all the time. Sometimes it's sports and stuff outside of work. Sometimes it's a blur uh, in terms of where you would uh, where you would partition that stuff. Who are your favorite teams? Well, you got to remember, I've got a burden, and that I'm a New York Giants fan trapped in Dallas. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of you may remember there was a quarterback for the Cowboys by the name of Roger Staubach. And I've gotten to know Roger well. And I grew up hating him because all he did was beat my poor Giants all the time. And I finally had to admit to Roger that I was a Giants fan. I avoided, you know, I really was embarrassed. I wouldn't tell him for years. Uh, but uh, no, but you have to grow and adopt the Cowboys if you're in Dallas as well. And hopefully the Rangers make it through a playoff season. And I won't even go there on the horns. Thank you. That's Nobody, interesting because, nobody's you, brought because that your up bio yet. says you're a Cowboys fan. You know, <laughs> you never know what comes out of some of these offices. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Brian. I'm a first year business major. Um, I know yesterday tax instruments raised the dividend rate by 12%. So from your perspective, how do you determine whether you're going to go forward with something like that and like what kind of risk analysis do you use? You know, it's in some ways it's pretty simple, and that is uh, if you do the things I've talked about, run the company well, good strategy, get it stronger, take care of customers, hopefully at the end of that, you're going to have extra cash. Okay, it's the easiest way to describe it. And when that occurs, you then have a chance after you've decided you've invested everything you can in R&D and, and you're happy with all that, uh, you've got two things you can do, and that is you can pay dividends or you can buy back stock. If you think that your stock is actually worth more in the long term, it makes great sense to buy it now. So we just do very simple analysis along those lines, and uh, you then spend time with the board. And uh, that was, uh, I think we announced it a month ago or a couple weeks ago and got that done. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Miriam. Uh, I'm a senior here. I'm really excited that you're here today. Uh, my question has to do with not the jet lag side of travel, um, but the little bit more enjoyable side of travel. What have you experienced as a CEO that was kind of eye-opening to you in a different culture, whether it was dealing with your suppliers or your customers, um, something along those lines? Yeah, you know, in some ways, and we were talking even beforehand, and just look out in the audience at the diversity in this audience in terms of uh, and I don't mean even a U.S. definition uh, of ethnicity. I mean, look globally. And it's one of these things that you've got to remind everybody that the U.S. is only 5% of the population, and which means 95% of it is outside of our borders. So you've just got to be successful globally. And, and by the way, if you're going to be successful globally, if we have 5% of the population, what percent of the world's smartest people do we have? It's probably 5%, okay? So you wanna be able to attract people from around the world to be able to be part of your company, and you gotta call on customers around the world on that front. So uh, to me, that is the, the greatest thing you've just gotta remind people, and I know in the US, uh, the immigration debates, this thing gets all worked up with, you know, how do we, close and pull up a drawbridge and act like we're not part of the world, but that's, that's just backwards. Uh, we're a global world, we'll be better served as a country and as a company if we go compete successfully. And it's actually a blast because the diversity, uh, the cultures you get to meet, the great people that you get to meet, uh, it's really one of the best parts of the job. Thank you. 
I'm an electrical engineering student as well, and I was wondering why uh, or how you graduated as an electrical engineer and ended up in sales. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've told some people that uh, you know, I was president of the engineering, electrical engineering society, and we held a meeting at the end of the year with, with the professor, the, I don't know, it was eight or ten of us, and you know, we went around the table, who's going and doing what? And there was, in upstate New York, there were three approved places you should go. You should go to IBM, you should go to AT&T, which had Bell Labs at the time to get your masters, or there was a company in Boston by the name of Digital Equipment back then. You could go design computers or computer chips. And everyone went around, you know, Bell Labs, IBM, you know, DEC, you know, Texas Instruments and Sales. And the professor was like, what are you doing, wasting your education? You know, I didn't, I didn't know I was wasting it. Um, and I just, you know, I figured try something different. And uh, that's really what led me to make that choice. I was still going to be very close to technology, was, which is what I cared about. I mean, it was my fascination uh, from my dad being close to the semiconductor operation at IBM. It's what I wanted to be near, it's what I enjoy today. And this was actually, and in hindsight, it was the best way to see it. Because you got to see a broad set, you got to see what customers were doing with it. And you get to learn that pretty quickly. So, you know, at the end, I was I was pleased I made that choice. Thank you. I wasn't so sure at the time, but I was pleased that I decided. <laughs> Howdy, Rich. I'm Ryan Rao. I'm a computer engineer and now a first year MBA student. Don't have an internship yet, Sam. Um, <laughs> my sister works for you in Dallas and loves it. Um, and she informed me that you're not a fan of the term Internet of Things, but there's definitely a lot of stuff with networks facility now. How do you view that market and how are you positioning TI to excel in it? Yeah, <clears throat> this is where I get in trouble on things. I should keep my opinion quiet. My only issue on Internet of Things is that uh, it's too talked about, it's too hyped, and it's promised to cure everything from discovering another solar system to every dreaded disease. And I don't like hype because companies that get tied to hype have fun for a month or two months or a quarter or a year, and then the hype doesn't meet the promise, and then people are like, well, what happened? It was supposed to be you know, $50 billion, and it didn't turn out that big. But if you back up, and it's actually where I am as excited about the world today as I've been in 35 years, and you say, is the world gonna get more connected? Are cars gonna get smarter, safer, more efficient? Are, you know, who's seen the uh, Nest uh, thermostat uh, Google bottom? How many folks in the room? You've had thermostats in your houses your entire lives, right? They had maybe 10 cents of semiconductors in those thermostats. Nest thermostat comes out, probably got $20 because it's smart, it's adaptive, it learns your patterns, and it can make adjustments. That's happening across all this equipment. From motors, it, you know, would put a blower for a room like this, uh, to the electrical grid, and in order to make things smarter and, and more serviceable, you gotta put intelligence inside of them. Well, where's that intelligence gonna come from? Well, hopefully from TI. <laughs> and so, if that's your definition of Internet of Things, I'm wildly passionate, because we are just absolutely positioned with all the right technologies to go do those things. I just don't want the hype label tied up on top of that thing, because I, I just, I find that really dangerous for a company to get tied to to any one thing on that front. But I, 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 you can tell, I am, I am just as excited about innovation that we're staring at for the next 10 years. It's gonna be more fun than the past 35, as, as crazy as things have been. Thank you. Hi, Rich, my name is Vignesh Ramdas, and I'm a sophomore marketing and economics major. Um, you mentioned that you're a technology enthusiast, and I would put myself in the same category. What are some trends and things like that in the next 10 to 15 years that you see in that industry um, that you're excited about? You just heard the list. It just literally think of, you know, so many of us, when we think about technology, it's the smartphone in our hand, or it's our PC or TV. It's, you know, it, it has historically, been something, or for the past 10 years, let me be careful, historically, been that personal device in front of you. Well, in many ways, and it's following a pretty classic trend, that evolution of an ecosystem goes from the mainframe and mini computers to the PC and networking, 
And now most of the innovation that's talked about are the applications that run on a cell phone. Uh, be it WhatsApp, be it Uber, you know, you pick it, the social media part of the thing. Well, that cycle's gonna run as well. And, and I just challenge people, why is Google or Apple working on a car? Because they're looking out ahead at what's gonna happen next to that question. And they say, that thing can be better. It can be safer, it can be better connected or you know, more efficient. And so those are the types of things. I don't care if it's in the healthcare, medical electronics, be it you know, personal body, be it scanning, instrumentation, uh, broad in, uh, industrial systems, the automotive marketplaces. Uh, you just look at the world around you that's being solved in a mechanical way, it's a pretty good chance they're gonna put electronics in it to make it smarter, to make it use less energy. Um, if your air condition is starting to wear out, uh, the service that's connected by Wi-Fi and your service technician will know before it breaks, uh, I've got a condenser or a compressor going out on that air conditioner, so when they show up for the house call, they know what's breaking and they fix it and they have the part. And so those are the kind of things that are really gonna be, uh, be fast. That's why I think it's a great time uh, for all of us. You guys are in, it, you guys are in a perfect position. Uh, because we've got you know many problems and we've got great tools uh, to be able to go address them. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Rich, very much. Do you have any last bits of advice to to give? Move forward. <laughs> okay, I I get asked a lot. Well, gee, I need to plan out the perfect career. Just start. Okay, you'll get answers as that goes along. I think you guys are in a great place. I think you've picked uh, a wonderful school. Okay, to go to. I think it'll serve you well. And the last piece is please don't be afraid to give back. Okay, the impact that you can have back on who's in junior high, who's in high school today, keep that in perspective. Okay, somebody may have helped you reach and pull you up, do the same reaching back. You can make a big, uh, big impact on people as well. Thank you. Kenny will now take over again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean Starks and Mr. Templeton. We appreciate you guys taking your time out of your schedule to speak with our students. I know that we'll be able to take your lessons about moving forward, about giving back, and about jet lag, and apply them into our own lives. Um, so we have a tradition here at VIP. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Templeton with this personalized Sensing Cowboy hat, a recognition of your participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. This is to make sure I'm not confused that I'm in Texas. <laughs> Kenny, you're going to bring that thing up just so that can end up on a photo somewhere. Is that correct? Okay, we'll be ready. We'll be ready. Thanks. <laughs>